So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to very briefly uh, present the case and then we'll discuss potential strategies uh, with the panel and audience. So, the, um, the case is going to be performed by Elliot Smith and James Spratt um, with Andreas, I think, um, commentating from Bart's. And the case is a 66-year-old man. He's had previous grafts um, 16 years ago. He's also had angioplasty to his right coronary uh, via the vein graft in 2015. And he's got uh, CCS class 3 angina, which is restricting his lifestyle with anterior ischemia on his stress echo. He's got a past history of renal transplant um, with an EGFR of 37. And his angiogram shows, this is the vein graft to the diagonal. <coughs> and you'll see the LAD is occluded and the vein graft is backfilling um, to the LED and there's significant disease in the mid to distal what, LED as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The vein graft to the right is open <clears throat> and you see there and you saw on the previous slide that the LED is, is flush occluded at the origin of a, of a diagonal. He's had a CT, and you'll see the CTO length is 25 millimeters by CT, and there's a significant amount of calcification. And of course, you see down at the bottom, there's that distal LED lesion, which you saw on the angiogram. So I'm gonna stop there, and we're gonna discuss uh, potential strategies for reopening this LED, Tony. So Simon, we would, we would agree that the, the case is indicated. The patient has symptoms and uh, reversible ischemia. Complex case. Um, I think we have some questions before we go live. We still have 10 minutes before we go live. So let's have the first question for the audience. And um, we will be, can we, can we have the first question? And the response, um, do they have, can you do it via the text? Okay. So, so Ian, can we have the first question for the audience, please? Well, okay. Why don't we start by just asking the panel what, um, well, first of all, I guess, would each of you take this on? And if so, what approach? <clears throat> um, in any case, if it's clinically indicated, you would take the case on as a hybrid operator. So I'd like to start with that. Um, if the clinical indication is there based on viability, ischemia, and symptoms, um, the anatomy dictates strategy and does not um, dictate whether you pursue an attempt or not. So um, in this case, we would take it on, yes. So as a hybrid operator, in, 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 in any case, you take a look at the proximal cap, the lesion length, uh, the distal target, and can I get retro. And based on those four questions, uh, you go into the hybrid algorithm and you make a plan A, and if that doesn't work, you switch strategies. So, Explain what hybrid is. Um, the hybrid algorithm is, def is, <coughs> is developed uh, primarily in the, in the US, but also in the, in here in, 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 uh, from Belfast and, and, and spread throughout uh, uh, the globe. And it basically um, entails that you learn four ways to tackle a CTO. That's being anti-grid wiring, retrograde wiring, anti-grade dissection entry and retrograde dissection entry because basically those are the only four options you have to tackle a CTO. So once you've mastered those four techniques, you need to see, okay, which is now indicated. Uh, large databases has taught us that approximately 50% is anti-grade wiring, a third is um, the retrograde approach and about 15% is anti-grade dissection entry with cross bus strangulation systems. So based, based on those four, four um, approaches to tackle a CTO. Now you need to make plan A, B, C, and D based on the four features I just mentioned. And you're gonna see with the first shots that we're gonna see up with, uh, with James and Dr. Smith in just a couple of seconds, that the double arterial ex uh, uh, access and the double arterial um, uh, shots will give us great information, much more than the diagnostic angio, about the four features that we're gonna use to tackle the CTO. Okay, so let's run along the panel, Keith. Thoughts in addition, anything new to add to that? <coughs> you take this case on? Well, yeah, I think as a group we would take this case on. Just to go back to AJ's point about training, we, so we've evolved a, a practice where we have a very clearly defined lead CTO operator, Margaret McIntyre, who's in the audience, <coughs> and she has um, worked alongside multiple of our other colleagues 
so that they are all acquiring experience in how to deal with complex CTO PCI uh, with, with her um, as the lead operator, and I think that's a very nice model, and it means that the, the training uh, gets spread around, and of course, as we all know, if you start to get good at CTO PCI, then it, uh, it, the skills are very transferable onto other, let's say, less complex PCI. So the, the lab's ready. Can we yeah, come please. back to it? I think the messages are that this is a suitable case for intervention to CTO. <coughs> there are a number of options, some of which I'll try and help uh, steer you through as the case goes along. Uh, but uh, you need to be experienced in CTO. You must be able to do all of these things if you're taking on a case. I think you must be able to do anti-grade wire escalation, anti-grade dissection re-entry, and retrograde. But I see uh, Andreas on the screen. So should we link live <coughs> to uh, the cath lab? We're going live, guys. At St. Bartholomew's. Andreas. <laughs> Hello. There. You're there. Hi. We Good morning. We're there. Can you hear me? I'm... Um, we can hear you. We've got a great yeah, you panel can. and right. a great Good. audience. Good morning. Welcome That's to right. the panel. Welcome, welcome to the audience. Welcome to the first uh, live case it's from BART to ACI. In. We're in Cath Lab 1 of the new BART Heart Center. And the case that you've just now discussed is already uh, pretty much underway. Um, we have come uh, a long way, and you will see uh, the individual stages in a moment. We were never thinking that we could do the full case in 50 minutes. So we'll focus on uh, discussing the strategies, um, the approach to an ambiguous cap, the use of IVUS, and what an open vein graft can do for you. I'm here with two expert CTO operators, Elliot Smith, who leads the CTO program at BARTS, and James Spratt, who recently joined uh, St. George's. My role is really uh, the one of the non-CTO expert operator uh, who will probably translate and communicate if those guys have their hands full and are lost for words. Knowing James and Elliot, I won't have to say much. So <laughs> I'll hand over to Elliot to show us where we are. Okay. I'm going to talk through the angiogram. So uh, good Thank morning, you. James. Everyone. Why don't you take it forward while I do this extra? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, so we'll start with the angiograms. I, I understand you've got an expert panel there, uh, and we're looking forward to a very interactive session. So if we just uh, show me the angiogram from the start, if possible. If you just stop two seconds, Elliot, there. Just show us the initial angiograms. I understand you've discussed the case already. Is that correct? Yes, we have. Yeah, yeah we have. OK, yes. so here we have an el eliocaudal view. Uh, where a wire has been placed into a high diagonal ramus branch. And I think that anatomic classification of what that branch is is extremely important to this case. You can see a little bit of staining just sort of hidden behind at the sort of uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, and that's the LED. This is a single catheter injection at present. Go forward to the next view, please. So this is a dual catheter injection with an L1 guide well down the vein graft to uh, the diagonal. You can see a couple of issues here. First of all, that the diagonal is tented. That's usually a sign that the, the vein is too short and can create technical problems in terms of access retrogradely, etc. Uh, go forward again, please. So here's a cranial projection of the same thing. You can see the diagonals onto the vein. You can see there's high-grade disease at the anastomosis or the, the bifurcation between D1 and the LED. And you can see just about see the, the distal cap of the occlusion. And you can also see that distal uh, in the distal LED, there's further high-grade disease over a, a, a fairly long area. Go forward, please. So uh, I heard Paul talking earlier about how we classify this occlusion. Uh, what we can see from this particular uh, cranial projection is that the cap is unclear, so we call that ambiguous. And we need to do something to clarify that so we can escalate antigradely. Uh, we can see the distal cap is clear uh, and the occlusion itself is relatively short. Uh, the fact that it's a bypass adds a degree of complexity to it because we know from pathology that there's a much higher instance of calcium within occluded segments and generally they tend to be um, a little bit longer, not, perhaps not the case in this situation. And a further marker of complexity is that there's a degree of tortuosity which will become apparent in due course. Go forward, please. James. So this I... is the eleocranial projection. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Tony. Yeah, just... just uh... Just, I, I think it, it, it's very interesting, but just uh, tell us the, 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 the first strategy you thought of was uh, anti-grade 
with perhaps uh, despite the, the length of the, the lesion and the calcification, uh, but you rejected that on the basis of what? So um, I think Just there's a couple of thinking. considerations. First, f firstly, um, uh, I think it's a, a, a mistake to consider cases as anti-grade or, or retrograde. They're just cases, and I think that's one of the significant barriers to C2PCI at the moment, that we have this kind of... People, when they're starting, have a fairly rigid mindset, and they work within the skill sets that they've developed over their, over their career. So I think we would encourage people to look at the vessel in, in a more 3D, rounded perspective. So what, what the challenges lie in this case is identification and penetration of the proximal cap. The secondary challenge lie in retrograde access. You know, this doesn't look like a terribly retroflexed access to the proximal vessel, but that can be a consideration. And then a further additional consideration is the tolerability of the patient when we've got retrograde equipment across the diagonal um, LED anastomosis. Now, if we take that as an anti-grade case only, yes, that's feasible anti-gradely. But what makes it difficult and what makes it more likely to be a subintimal case, which we've solved by dissection re-entry is the angulation and the calcium. So that means that we're going to have to require a fairly high penetration force to deal with the proximal cap. It's an eccentric entry to the vessel that increases the probability of subintimal passage. And um, uh, you can see the distal vessel is a lot more diseased than the proximal vessel. So our, our deal scenario here is to create a connection within the CTO body itself. That protects all the branches. You can see that there's a big diagonal, there's a the, our ramus branch as well. We want those branches to be healthy and perfusing myocardium at the end of this procedure. So we're looking to create a communication within the CTO body itself. Now, as you know, Tony, you have to approach these cases with a degree of flexibility. So we, we work on a probabilistic assessment. We start with what's likely to work, and if it doesn't work, we change it. So we can take you through what we've done with that kind of mindset uh, in place. Yep. So if you go forward again there, please. So the first thing we did here is an IVIS run to uh, see if we could clarify where the proximal uh, LED cap is. And I'll hand you over to the resident IVIS expert to talk you through the IVIS run. So once we change to IVIS, I'm just going to go back. Yeah, you go ahead and yeah. trap everything out there. So, so James, I'm sorry to, yep. to pester, we want to see the case, but you looked at all the options the, uh, and you have to choose IVIS one initial strategy. And you felt based yeah, on course. the... Um, the lack PA of, uh, of, of a nipple at the beginning of the LAD and the calcification that a anti-grade strategy was not your first choice. Is that correct? Good. Okay. Um, Let's just go back to PA No, Crane, it's not really correct. I think, you, you know, I look at the case and I think what's mo most likely to work. And, you, you know, if, if for example, but there's also... There's also problem areas within the case that need to be solved, irrespective of how the case finishes. And, and one problem area is the proximal cap puncture. Now, if we do the proximal cap puncture and the wire goes into the distal true lumen, then we're very happy. But if we don't, it just becomes a component of the way we solve the case. So we, we then move on to solving it either from a retrograde or an anterograde dissection re-entry perspective. But what I'm saying to you is based on the angiographic assessment, the probability of true lumen wiring antigradely is lower. That doesn't mean it's zero, and I couldn't give you a very accurate figure of what it does mean, but it does mean it's lower. So we're working within that capacity. So what we've done, and, and you'll see subsequent to, uh, to the IBIS, is set ourselves up for success so that if plan A doesn't work, then plan B comes into play and so on. But I think I, I, I would, would want to re-emphasize that Having a, a rigid way of forward, 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 approaching forward. the case will tend to make Better. you overinvest yeah, in areas yeah. where things aren't likely to work. So you'll, you'll spend longer make in sure a solution that's less likely to work rather than switchly moving to, to a solution that is likely to work. Okay, so with so that in mind, we'll, we'll go to the sure, IVIS sure and the talk IVIS, you through yeah. that. And then we'll ask some comments from the panel. <laughs> ah, sure. Good morning, my name is Jesus Burantas. Sure. I'm a Kozalan cardiologist working at the Bart's Heart Center. This is I was pulled back starting from the well. distal diagonal Traffic, coming to the Traffic. left main stem. Forward. You can yeah, appreciate yeah. to have just passed the origin the of the uh, uh, LAD and we're coming back to the uh, yeah. uh, circuflex. Get a two five. Um, Give us a two five balloon, please. 
there is a fibrotic plaque, as you can see here, which does not cause significant stenosis. And this is now the origin of Secuflex coming at 6 o'clock. And we'll come back to the left main stem. So just to show you a bit more the uh, origin of the uh, uh, LAD. Huh? We're still across. We're so okay. just movement. It so is just two five billion. Two five billion. We think that it's just coming at approximately at uh, two o'clock. So and as you can see, as we have also seen that in the CT. There is a, a calcification in the outer vessel wall of the left anterior descending we artery. So we measure the distance between uh, the origin of the lady and the uh, bifurcation of the LAD with the circumflex, and we found that it's 12 mm, uh, 12.7 uh, millimeters, suggesting that there is enough space to deploy a stem. In addition, we measure the left main stem area, and we found that the lumen diameter is approximately 5 millimeters, same, indicating that if we have come to come back to the left main stem, we can deploy a 4 millimeter stem there. Great, that's very helpful. Uh, Tony, okay. were you going to invite comments from our distinguished panel? So, yeah, let's just uh, okay, wander just along the panel. I think we started with Paul. We'll come back to Paul, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask you how the uh, CT findings uh, have influenced your strategy here, uh, and is that part of your routine workup? So, that's a good question. I think the, short, the answer to question two is no, it's not part of routine strategy, uh, because most of the time there's a degree of homogeneity to vessel anatomy that we don't kind of need it. But in the post-bypass scenario, it's a very different animal, and I think here it, it was particularly helpful. So, we did get a CT scan, and the CT scan confirmed that that branch in which we had the ibis was uh, essentially anatomically a diagonal. So, in other words, the LED arose from it. Or, or, or the other way around, as it were. Um, so, so that was very helpful. It showed us that the occlusion length was calcific within the body of the occlusion, but the proximal cap of the occlusion, as you've just heard from the ibis, wasn't quite as calcified. So in other words, um, it should be a little bit easier to penetrate. Now, the one thing I would say about penetration in the, in the presence of angulation is that the, the greater the angulation of a vessel, the lower the effective tip load of the wire. So if you have an angulation which is 90%, that lowers your effective wire tip load by about 80%. And that's why we have to use stiffer wires when the angle increases. So regardless of the, what the plaque looks like, we know that the probability of using a stiff wire is very high. James, do you have enough information from so the angiogram not to use, uh, rather than use the IVUS to identify the ostium of the LAD? Um, prob probably not, is a short answer, Tony, and, and I, I think there are two so things that we can do to identify the origin. Uh, one thing is that when you have this post-bypass scenario, the anatomy becomes very distorted. You get a lot of tenting in the vessels, angulations appear where they, they, they don't normally appear. Uh, and uh, you can see that in the, those LEO caudal views that we were showing you earlier, where the LED actually looked very close, but that's just a question of kind of uh, foreshortening. James, why don't you go through so what... Uh, yeah, so if you go forward... Let's see some action. Let's see go some, forward some pictures, yeah? Yes. Uh, I can... Yeah, okay. So we just... Where were we last time? Go forward again. Forward again. Forward again. And keep going. No. Keep no. going. <laughs> keep going. Okay. Keep going. Sorry, again. must me. Sorry, we're all set. Ready forward, to yeah. Spiral. Two stuff. I'll talk you to where we are, and then we'll go back okay. to Elio. So this is the ibis forward. That's our acquisition yeah. showing where the cap is. That's the Elio caudal view of the same. Uh, forward again, and again. The audience can see that the ibis is in this diagonal. Okay, a very let's go back one view. Picture of the origin of the uh, LAD. Play that view. So, so, the, so this is a, a Turnpeg LP with a cyan wire going down the vein graft and back up the LED. Uh, go forward again here. That can be one of the areas, which is, play that view please, which is a little bit tricky uh, uh, when you have a vein graft anastomosis because the angle, uh, will, the wire will tend to prolapse. But we've got enough of the vessel that that wasn't the major what, concern here. So the LP goes going? smoothly around that angle. It's a cyan wire, <coughs> so a relatively low gram uh, tip wire. Go forward again, please. Play that view, please. Uh, so this is the, the cyan wire going into somewhere that we do want to be. Uh, go forward again. And this is a cranial, AP cranial projection um, with the LP in place. Go forward again. James, We're then trying to can clarify. I, James, did, this is Paul, can I slightly go interrupt forward. you? Because as, as an operator, I, I would like to know, are you going, or is totally. your first attempt reverse wiring or go reverse cart? 
I think this is important. Yeah, well, well, I think that is a good question, Paul. Go forward again. Uh, and I think um, people are very tempted to do wiring in this scenario um, because it seems short and why not give it a go? And they think, well, what's the downside? Well, the downside uh, can be um, subintimal wire passage proximal to the occlusion segment, and that can re result in true vessel compression. So we had a very limited, with that in mind, a very limited attempt uh, with a Gaia 3 wire, and I think we were just a little bit confounded by the anatomy and the angulation. So we, it was a very short attempt. Go forward so, again. So James, and again. can I just explain and to the audience what reverse cart is? Because I'm not sure that many in the audience will sure. fully understand forward that. Again. Can Shall I just do that very quickly? Should we move forward? Forward again. Can I have the, yeah, uh, of course. the uh, uh, iPad? Forward again. Yeah. And again. Ian, can I have... You, you go ahead. Just, just while you're doing that, the, um, if you can open the up the ACI yeah. app on your phone and go to the session, the live uh, Q&A, the questions are on, on the app, and you can submit questions as well. Uh, is it really part of the interaction? <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, um, so what you've seen so far is Agreed. that they've come down the, XT the vein ready, graph and gone back up and have a wire here. Good. And uh, this is the uh, ambiguous in. cap just here. I think the, there's a number of ways you can approach this. You can just take the wire right the way through, uh, and they've tried a Gaia third, which is a, a, quite a stiff wire. The alternative, and I think we should understand you hear a lot about reverse cart, is to make a go sub intimally here, put a balloon on this wire, and then this retrograde wire that's come down the vein graft enters that space where the balloon is, and then goes retrogradely out. So what you're creating sub is a balloon here, a retrograde wire, this is sub and the retrograde wire goes into that space and you join <coughs> lumen to lumen through a sub space, and that's called a reverse cart. So that's what maybe what they're going to do, uh, and that's what you should look out for, a largest balloon in a sub space with that's, wire going into that's that That's definitely what they will do, Tony. Okay. I think there's no alternative. Um, to James, um, James, can you still yeah, hear us? So we're, we're kind of. Is, is yeah, we can. So one, of the, kind of one of the questions, James, was whether you could show the IVIS again, showing the origin of the LAD in the diagonal. Yeah, we could do that, but we're, we're, I think we could show you a little bit more of a money shot than that. Uh, um, so if you story if, if you go if you go back a view for us, Elliot, hang on two seconds. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then we'll go live with uh, that. Yeah. Just getting it to, to the point. But not so, the so we were at a critical juncture there. If you go back a couple of views. ACT, yeah. In, in keeping with the, back again, please. If, in, and one more. So in keeping with what we described, and one more, uh, with the angulated calcific cap, it actually took a Confianza Pro 12 to penetrate into it. And that's using a dual lumen caster. You can see the two dots on the screen just sort of hidden by the clips. So the dual lumen caster actually increases penetration force right. in this scenario. And it'll restore your confidence up to about 12 grams, the tip load. So Elliot very skillfully punctured the cap. And then he did something which is called an exchange of, of equipment. So he brought the dual lumen caster back. He inflated a balloon proximal to it within the guide to trap the wire. And he came back down with uh, a different uh, single lumen microcaster, in this case, uh, a turnpike spiral, uh, with a view to getting overlapping equipment. So if you go forward again, you can see that. In real time, we're taking a couple of uh, orthogonal views just to confirm forward again. Really, really important that Elliot's got resistance on that wire tip. Uh, these very stiff wires can exit quite easily, and you've got to make sure there's resistance on the tip. Go forward again. And once more, please. And here, this is that, that play, please. So this is Elliot advancing the turnpike spiral into the occlusion segment. This is a key skill for, for CTO operators. It's very easy to let that distal wire go forward. Next. It's very easy to let the wire prolapse and go back and let it play. Uh, it been, uh, shorter. Um, and it's really, really important that, that goes, the turnpike spiral goes past the cap because that enables you to then uh, work within the occlusion segment. Now, uh, you can see actually that our retrograde wire is actually in a knuckle formation and it's gone into the diagonal branch. 
we've got a really interesting ibis that we can show you from that. So we didn't actually intend for the knuckle to go as far as that, but it kind of deflected off the cap and uh, went into uh, the diagonal branch. And we, we, we did a secondary ibis just to see uh, what that meant in terms of the vessel anatomy. So we can show you that run. And at this stage, uh, what our next plan is to take the stiff wire out, which is now uh, quite dangerous and it's got a very big angulation on, on the curve. And we plan to de-escalate to, to uh, achieve over, overlapping dissection planes using a soft wire, in this Let case, a, a fielder ex XT. Explain knuckle. So when you're going retrograde or anti-grade in the sub space, go ahead the it's much safer to sure, make a knuckle on wire. Yeah. It's a bit like, like blunt dissection rather than use sure stiff wire. So whenever it's possible, if you're that. approaching the sub sure space, a knuckle on the wire is absolutely mandatory for safety. I'd like to comment on uh, a couple of things in the tree. You can see that they're using an eight French in an integrate fashion and a seven French and to get retro. Um, CTO hybrid operating is not a slander game. Uh, this is large bore catheters because you keep all options open for IFAS, uh, uh, the micro catheter support. Uh, I think this is important. And also important in this procedure doing the reverse card that you uh, saw that the, the micro catheter in anti-grade and retrograde fashion were dancing, as we call it. So they're, they're, in the, they're from um, multiple planes, they're, they're in the same plane. That doesn't mean they're in a true lumen, but we are what they call in the architecture. So with, they are within the vessel structure. And that's a, that's a safety um, and a monitoring. If things are dancing out of phase, that's always bad. In this case, they're dancing in phase, which is, great, great, which is great, always good. Great, great. That's really good. That's, okay, uh, James, let's uh, yeah. have a look at the IVIS again, please, for one minute. Yeah, the, yeah. so we'll go to the, our IVIS expert again. Uh, IVIS was performing in order to see whether the uh, knuckle wire was in the true lumen diagonal uh, or not. And uh, now we're coming back for, again from the diagonal uh, to the left main stem. And you can appreciate that the lumen diameter has changed. There's come some compression uh, in a way uh, in the distal uh, diagonal. And now we're approaching the origin of the LED, and you can see the, uh, the, the, the wire. Um, and this is two characteristic frames that have been obtained. This is indeed the uh, guide wire, the knuckle wire, and there are the two tips of the knuckle wire that have made the loop. And uh, uh, it's obvious that there is in the, some intimal space. Uh, this is a dynamic view that you can appreciate uh, where exactly the uh, knuckle wire is located in a lumen in vessel architecture. Uh, there are two uh, um, uh, um, parts of the body of the wire that you can see at uh, four o'clock and at uh, eight o'clock, indicating that uh, the wire is in the submintimal space. Okay, so great. The so, so space is, is your friend you know what, and is the gap between two this lumens. Is John, any comments? <coughs> John, McDonald, yeah. yeah. I mean, in some ways, the uh, showing that your retrograde wire is subintimal, uh, and from the appearance of the antegrade wire, it would appear to be subintimal as well. That means you're in a good a good spot because obviously it's easier to connect the spaces when both wires are in the same space. Let's have the guideliner as well. So, James, let's see you live. Let's see what's happening. Okay, you back with us? Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So, so if you just okay, play, just your blue screen is, is on there. You can see what Elliot's doing now. He's taking the comfy ends out. He's put a fielder XT down and he's pushed it very gently. So it, it looks like it's conformed to the vessel uh, very well. We're going to take an orthogonal view to confirm that. Um, and, and then our plan from there, in this situation, there are a couple of absolutely key points. First of all, uh, when we're advancing retrograde equipment into the left main, we must be absolutely certain that we're not in the subintimal space. Now, there's only really one fail-safe way to do that, and that's with guide down a reverse cart. So that means we bring down a guideliner over the anti-grid wire, we balloon the proximal cap, and we deliver the guideliner into the occlusion segment. And then we look to wire that occlusion segment with the retrograde wire. That way we can be sure that we're not going to compress the proximal left main, which can obviously be hemodynamically catastrophic. So I think that's a, that's so a really Elliot's important point. Now, you deliver the guide catheter in a way to the occlusion so that whenever you go retrogradely out of your subintimal space 
uh, in a reverse you cart, you when... enter the guide catheter extension <coughs> almost immediately so that you're then true in the true lumen because you're in the guide catheter. So guidelines in this situation delivered into the CTO are really, really, really important. Can we go back to so that we're, we're view lie with that you had the before? Um, the aliocranial view. Yeah, Johnny. there was a great so view that I that to just just yeah. showed the connection. A yeah, bit we, we we can do that. So, so I'll just show you, show you what's happening at the moment. So that's Elliot bringing the turnpike spiral back. We have uh, a dedicated uh, balloon in place, uh, and we're using that to trap. And then what we're going to do is balloon the cap and deliver the guide liner at the same time. I think there, this might be a little bit tricky to do because of the degree of angulation <clears throat> and the relatively short occlusion segment. But as we've discussed, it's absolutely key to kind of safety in this, this environment. Uh, you'll notice that uh, in terms of the Go retrograde on, equipment, we probably need to bring that back at some point. And I mean, we could do that any time, really. Uh, the, 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 the Turnpike LP retrograde is a little overcommitted. And the wire retrograde uh, is obviously not where we want it to be. So what we're aiming to do, as you've expertly discussed with the reverse car is to create a communication, a common communication. And the reason people are a little bit alarmed about that, they think, well, you're ballooning the subintimal space. Is that not dangerous? Well, actually, the whole tensile strength of the vessel is largely dependent on the adventitia. So, uh, and of course, within the subintima, we're within the adventitia. And the adventitia is about three or four times as strong as the media or the intima. Really important. So we're actually using um, yeah. uh, those principles of a compliant adventitia to create a common space. And the other reason why it works very well is that unlike plaque, it doesn't recoil. So we develop stents because of plaque recoil. If you don't get recoil within the subintima because you don't have plaque, you've got a very kind of... Um, Blood-rich, uh, rather friable material, which dissects very easily. And Jensen, from so you, and, there, there's and, a, and the audience, I think you're going to pop in an eight French guide right now, right? You're not going to be small on well, this. Well, well, I mean, I think it's it, it, Paul. It's a trade-off between uh, delivery and efficacy here. And an eight French guide liner is a fairly decent ask through this kind of degree of angulation. So we may compromise with a seven, uh, but your your point is well made that actually. A large guide liner is easier to wire retrogradely than a that small one, but there's got to be a little bit of trade-off in terms of deliverability. James, some yeah. of the audience uh, are yeah, uh, just uh, you can let giving us I'm some questions everything. here. Um, can you, Balloon, can you explain exactly which vessel is which? Uh, the projective view is slightly confusing. That's why I asked you to go back to that other yeah. view. Okay, so, so, can just so let's go to Elio Cranial briefly. Just sh sh should we show that? Yes, please. Yeah, that'd be great. So Elliot's also keen on that. I so answer about the reverse cart. Hello, I am here. He is, he is, a, he is a fairly key component of all this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's show the Elio Cranial. If, a, Elliot, if you just uh, step on that pedal yep. for a second. I think let's it does lay it out very nicely. There. So that's you've got perfect. from that, coming from uh, 11 o'clock you've got vein graft it's a better wire down vein well. graft and you've got uh, LP around the corner and back up you've got a yeah. knuckle extending from the LP into the diagonal branch in the subintima as we confirmed by Ivis you have an anti-grit wire coming down through the cap with a very small knuckle at the point so of stay fixed. Uh, that kind of LED um, anastomosis and we need to be very careful of that because we don't want that knuckle to extend into the LED and, and cause uh, vessel compromise there. You so, know, you know, there, it's not a straightforward reverse cart. It's a kind of small segment. There is calcium, yeah. there is angulation. You may want so to take I the think turnpike it, you know, we a little bit back careful. into yeah. the body of the CTO, don't yeah. you, James? Can I have yeah, the yeah, I just said that, but thanks for following up. Just, just stay yeah. on that view just so we can explain to the audience very again? quickly what's, what's happening. If I could have the iPad on, I can just <clears throat> draw it. Yeah, so balloon the cap. Deliver the guide liner. So basically, they've come I'm down just carry on, Tony, uh, if that's the vein right. graph. We'll and keep working here, here is explain. the microcatheter, just here. And they've gone back with um, uh, a knuckle coming. to here. So this is now yeah. subintimal space. This wire is also in the subintimal yeah, space. The guide, yeah. And the plan will be to put a balloon yeah, okay. in the subintimal the space Perfect. here. So a balloon there. And then Happy take there. this yeah, and retrograde wire into that retrograde the subintimal space yeah. and then out here. The, the important thing is that, that you should, okay, the, the there, yeah. connection must be made in the subintimal space the within the CTO. So that connection has to be made within the CTO. And you, this is a really good view, and you can see what's happening here. Uh, that the microcatheter, the wire on the right, 
is the wire in the subspace anti-grade, and that's where the balloon's going to go. And I suspect they'll bring their retrograde kit back a bit in order to access that balloon space. So that's a very good view. I think that, that helps us. Um, I think that's really the only question. So if, if this is a good view for you, it's certainly a better view for helping the audience understand. James. So now you have a balloon. Yeah, great. So, and are you going to bring the guideliner down now? Yeah, that's it. We just sort of came across a little hiccup in that we're going to have to lose the diagonal wire because um, we're not going to get the guideliner to go past it. So I think we just have to lose the diagonal wire. So regardless of where it is, the, the guideliner will not go past the diagonal. So, okay. so we have to lose diagonal wire. Um, we're using the balloon to deliver the guideliner. Again, this is a key point, Simon, that uh, we don't just shove the guideliner in and hope it goes down there. Uh, we make sure we almost massage it in by using a combination of plaque modification with a balloon, balloon down. and uh, anchoring okay. with the balloon as well. And, and we careful that we, the best way to put this in is to inflate the balloon uh, and then pull on the balloon almost as you push the guideliner. So you'll see this very nicely here. That, that's our diagonal wire out. That's a necessary evil. It's got to come out. Uh, we're going to inflate the balloon and we're going to um, so, so just tension the balloon, not pull it. Inflate the balloon. Up there. Um, and um, we're going to use that. So the balloon's inflated. We're also looking very carefully. There we go. That's the guideline that just gone into the LED. Deflate the balloon. Yeah, we can see that. And then screen that, please. Screen it, screen it. Can I have the iPad so, on, please? So now, so I now think the I would uh, actually... bring the LP back a smidgen. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why it's actually more useful to uh, don't bring the there we go, I'll leave it there yeah. So I'll go to guy three now. Okay. Mm. Punctures towards the balloon. Yeah, you yeah. Want to say a balloon, 12, so. uh, I, I, we're, we may need to upsize our balloon, um, but we're, what we're going to do is leave the balloon in place and take a guy three, and, we're, and Elliot's going to aim at the guide liner. Just go to so, six or something. Just leave it down at the moment, This is a big advantage of the, the guideliner facilitated approach. Now the distance between the retrograde uh, uh, MC and the anti-grade guideliner is, is three, just please. so short. Like so you can poke at please. it all you want, even with stiff wires, and it, it, it would still be safe. And so it protects that's why they all take of this area up here. You're, exactly. You're not having to go Diapies. retrogradely with your wire and damage here. You brought your guideliner down to here. So as soon as you go retrogradely through this space made by the balloon, you can enter the guideliner and then you're safe and protected all the way back to the left mate. I think a guideliner yeah, facilitated yeah, so, reverse so, card is pretty much standard now in most labs. So James, do you envisage any yeah, problems it, it, getting it the Gaia 3 uh, down the, uh, the retrograde microcatheter? Uh, no, don't think so. I mean, I think the angulation is not too bad going back the way up. I think, to my mind, when I look at that last balloon inflation, I think they're still in separate spaces. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think I, that's probably because retrogradely we are in the, sub the intimal plaque and antigradely we're probably subintimal. So that's one of the reasons for using a penetration directionable wire where we can oh, actually please. look to go through uh, tissue planes and puncture. And as Paul says, Good the enough. fact that we've got a clear target gives us confidence that we can increment penetration force without uh, worrying too much. So now that's a 2.5 balloon. This is, the LED is much bigger than that. Deflate balloon now. And what, what, what and wire? Bring the guy Leonard down a wee smidgen. What wire is it? The guy three. three. So guy three. three. Yeah. Bring the balloon back. And bring the balloon back. You shoot. can see that what's yeah, happened is uh. that they're aiming the guy three at the guideliner. <sighs> Uh, through that subintimal space. It's just at the tip of the guideliner there, and the balloon's just inside the guideline. Yeah, uh, and what Elliot's looking for is almost like a, almost like a pop and release. That's past it, Elliot. Yep, I agree. So, so uh, where, where he's looking for resistance, he's not looking for absence of resistance, because within the subintimal sub plane, you will tend to uh, have almost no resistance. That's past it. Well. It's but you know you're it. in. So it's definitely that looks past good, it. But you need a different so you, angle, you, don't you? I'm, I'm not sure. Well, it's not on the guide liner. No. It's no, definitely not on the guide liner. To be honest, let's just go uh, RAO. And just uh, watch four. your, your uh, LP as well. Yep. I'd also like to point out that these images may not look perfect. They're mm. working with 7.5 frames per second and uh, low magnification. Yeah, but so also note that the total radiation burden now in yeah. this 
relatively long you procedures, can do it in this 0.4 well, gray. Right, whatever. Um, so this is radiation management, such a procedure. You, you can see oh. here the so my, 308 balloon, please. And you can see the wire, just that second stitch Back, back, up. back, back, Elliot. Back, what back, back. Elliot's back, back. trying to do is to, I think it's might have to maybe a bit closer to the origin of the guideline. It's really short. Bring it back. I think you might but what he's trying to do is to come out the end of the microcatheter with a stiff dish wire and access the origin of the guideline and then he's in the true room. That looks better, Elliot. That's it. That's it. That's that's it. it. Isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. So if you just that's perfectly done there, uh, Elliot's actually wired the guide. So we just play that back for you again, and you can see how efficient the reverse card is if it's set up for success. Uh, that we get the guideline in place, we balloon the space. We have a short area, and it's been expertly wired by Elliot there. Brilliant. So well done, Elliot. Um, well done. So what we're going to do now, again, this is another important step. We're going to bring the balloon that was used to create the space back, and we're going to inflate it to trap this retrograde wire. And that enables us to anchor the retrograde microcaster into the guide liner. And then at that point, we're, please? we are going to exchange this short wire, 180 yeah, wire, 190 wire, for a 330 centimeter wire, which Can is I have the uh, either an RG3 or R350. Might be nice to uh, come tight on the uh, hands. And we're also going to well. use that, lose the anti-grade knuckle. That can come right out now. This is this one, yeah? Okay. So James, Abby, let me just down down explain hands. that. They, 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 they had the balloon here that, that was in the sub interval hands space. So and they well, managed to get the retrograde. Decks. They took the balloon back to here. They managed to get the retrograde wire into yeah, the guideline. The They've well. taken this balloon, this balloon yeah. here now so back, does, and they'll put it in down, please, the guide sure catheter the guide and trap uh, the wire so that they can now exchange things on a trap wire. Yeah. Then they'll take the guideliner, uh, they'll, they'll trap this, this, this wire here. And that will drag the oh, microcatheter all the way back so into here. You cannot pass a wire without a microcatheter cover. So once the microcatheter is here, they'll take this retrograde wire out and exchange it for a long wire along the microcatheter in the guide catheter out and then go reverse, uh, bring it out from the groin um, and then put a balloon. This is now the floppy end of the long 300 uh, centimeter okay. wire, and they'll put a balloon on this wire, going retrogradely up and then through the lesion to here. So you'll see this come out uh, of the groin, and then they'll put a balloon once they've got the 300 centimeter wire up. But they have to get the microcatheter through all of this to this area to be safe, and they do that by hot trapping the balloon the trap in the wire with the balloon they used previously. Once the microcatheter is here, they'll take this wire out and put a 300 centimeter wire down. So in terms of what we're speaking about, there's a question from the audience, what's, a, what's an LP that's a, that stands for low profile? So it's a term like low profile. And an MC is a microcatheter. Uh, uh, sorry for the, uh, the abbreviations. Uh, uh, frequently used within the CTO community. And the um, other question was the balloon size. So it used to be small, it used to be small, then it got big, and now you do uh, 2.5, and if that doesn't make enough space, you go up to 3. Agree, James? Okay. Yeah, 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 almost so always that's this. true. It depends on whether, what the mismatch is between anti-grade and retrograde. The only, say if, the, only, the only area where you, it doesn't matter if you take a bigger balloon, is where your anti-grade wire is in the subintimal space, Thank and you. your retrograde wire is in black. Of and that's because you just create a very large subintimal space and you don't create the communication. Do you want so to see externalization now, guys? Yeah, let's, let's have a look at Elliot doing the externalization and, I, and I'll uh, talk you through that a little bit. James, so in this situation... James, uh, there's an important issue. Your externalization system is now in the diagonal branch and you need to get a wire in the LED, correct. right? So how are you going to solve that uh, issue? You're a step ahead. Well, I mean, yes, that's true. So, so um, go, going back to the just original point, I think here we use a very small balloon, okay. um, and then we, you know, only two five eight. As Tony says, we could have gone quite a bit bigger than that. Okay. Can I, just I think the next step in the procedure stop. is something called externalization. The, uh, Tony, did you just describe the externalization? We have some lights on my fingers. Is this that is, okay, guys? This is a great image Sorry here because you. Uh, what you see on the screen is the is retrograde microcatheter, that little dark area just by the second stitch down. He's taken the uh, see, retrograde wire out. 
and uh, he's got his microcatheter in his guide catheter, so that's safe. So this yeah, microcatheter goes see. all the way retrogradely down the diagonal graft, up through the occlusion, down through the left main, and into the anti-grade guide catheter. And he'll now take a, well, he's ex exteriorized already. So this is a 300 uh, wire, uh, 300 centimeter wire, uh, that he's exteriorized through the groin and is coming out the Y connector. So this is the floppy end of the retrograde yeah. wire. And this is an RG3, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. stop there. This is RG3. Uh, there are okay. there are alternatives, as they say in the BBC. So so uh, there's also R350, which is a nitinol base wire. The RG3 is a little bit fiddly to work on because it's 010, uh, and it's a challenge to those of us who are more mature to actually see it. Um, uh, as as Paul said, there's always what's coming next in C2 procedures, and Elliot, what's coming next hold on. is Elliot. we've externalised. Elliot, just hold on. Let's just see Elliot's hands yeah. as he puts the balloon on the floppy end of the long wire. Can we show this is Elliot's not, this is hands not a on main screen, now. please? So that's the yeah, floppy this, this end, and he's putting a balloon on the floppy end of the wire to go retrogradely with the balloon. Tony, it's a dual lumen catheter. So yeah, you can, you can yeah so that pertains... Not a balloon, not a balloon. That pertains to the next part of the procedure, really. As Paul says... Our externalized wires from vein graft oh, into okay. diagonal nice into Sorry. proximal LED and externalized. Yeah, yeah. So we actually, our real target is the LED. So um, Elliot's now bringing the dual lumen caster down well, to uh, that point and he's going to use the side first. port of that uh, to, um, to wire the distal LED. We just got to get then we're, the we're basically micro catheter, yeah? Yeah, that's good. So he's brought, the, he's brought the retrograde microcaster back into the vein graft. Now, normally the role of the retrograde caster in this situation is to protect the collaterals. So that's a little less of a concern when you're down a vein graft. Uh, but you want to make sure that when you're on an, ex an externalized wire, what you do to one end of the wire actually has an impact on the other end. So, so if you're pulling things back, you actually can pull in the left main guide and that can cause serious problems. And if you look at uh, the registry data, the, 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 the incidence of donor vessel issues is round about 0.5%. Uh, and that usually happens when you pull retrograde equipment back on an externalized wire, you actually forcibly cause the guide to over-engage. And that's very much an avoidable problem. So here you can just see the dual lumen catheter coming out of uh, the... Um, so guide liner. We're going to go to an, like an REO cranial or something like that. Yeah, REO cranial sounds good. And um, we're going to take a soft wire, which is here. I'm just going uh, to try and... To, to wire the distal LED. And then at that point, uh, we're going to have to switch back to just an uh, anti-grade system. This is the, yeah, give me a fresh one. This has got a double bend on it and we've got some downstream disease. We'll just take a fresh sign blue. All I'm going to do here is just okay. deliver the wire up into the diagonal. I'm just going to try and drop on the bifurcation. We'll just go down the diagonal and then pull back into position. We're all good. We're a really good place here. And please note that they're not so, going to use yeah. anti-grade exactly, injections yeah. because there's a dissection plane. So it, it's imperative you that you don't there, yeah. inject anti -gradely. If you want to visualize the LED, you inject retrogradely where there's, there's no dissection plane. Um, this is a very important step because How if you inject so anti-gradely, the dissection plane increases and you might ruin the entire artery. Huh. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Paul. And actually, one thing that people who are moving into the C2 environment are surprised with is how little we do inject, actually, because what we're understanding with injection is basically anat anatomic relationships. And the, the presence of retrograde and anti-grade equipment often give us that answer without contrast. And we know, particularly in this patient who's on, who's on a renal guard, he's had a renal transplant, his EGFR is slightly under 40. We know the contrast has its downside as well as obviously its upside. So it's we're really limiting uh, our contrast injections to the bare minimum here. And we haven't actually taken any injections for quite James, some time. James, the dual lunar catheter, which you know, is a sort of a, an, an important nuance here, is to protect the diagonal. So you're, you're wiring the uh, diagonal and you have access still uh, to the well, the I retrograde mean, wire to sort the of, LAD Tony, occlusion. Uh, you see, there, there are a couple of nuances in this particular case, and we have an unobstructed vein graft to a diagonal. There's probably no reason not to leave that as it was at the start of play. I think the primary reason for the dual lumen caster here is that we don't have to negotiate the dissection planes with an anti-grade wire. 
So we come down on the externalized wire, we take that past the distal cap of the occlusion, and then we don't have to worry about finding dissection planes. And again, it's funny actually, you know, when, when I come across people who, who don't use dual lumen casters, most of the time it's down to a lack of familiarity with their use. And you can see in this case, they've been extremely helpful for the proximal cap. It was extremely helpful for this scenario. We're just going to make sure that Elliot's got a good root view. You're not way in the diagonal already, Elliot. You might be in the diagonal. Yeah, I would yeah. just show a little bit of contrast from there the vein graft. Go. There we go. And that's septal, yeah. There we go. Perfect. And that we know he's going to be very well, careful when he one. wires distally because of that downstream disease. But that's certainly one of the best moments when you wire the distal vessel uh, via Julian Cafter after an externalized wire. And I think uh, Elliot definitely deserves a round of applause there. He's not going to get one. Come yeah. on. Cheers, ah. mate. Come on. <laughs> uh, any uh, comment? I'm holding up the applause signs. I made them before. Hi, hi uh, Elliot. Any, any, any comment on, on the advantage of uh, the trap liner in this case as opposed to a guy So let's liner? blue on that wire. Thanks. Um, trap liner is not ready for prime time in the UK yet. So for the benefit of the audience, the guy liner, everybody's familiar with, plastic tube and a wire. Let's the difference a with a trap liner, it's got a balloon proximal to that. And it means that we can trap the wire uh, and use a guy liner at the same time. At the moment with the various, you know, designs of, <laughs> of uh, guide liner or guidezilla or Gideon, they all have the same issue with the back end in which it's very difficult to trap uh, equipment to uh, when you have, particularly when you have um, long microcasters like yeah, a Corsair, etc. So the trap liner does potentially offer a solution to that problem. As I said, it's not CE marked yet, we're hoping it will be CE marked in the near future. And I think we've probably got to reserve uh, judgment on its efficacy when that happens, but it could potentially be very helpful. And I assume you're going to uh, get rid of so the retro gear now, not to trap it? Yeah. Absolutely, Paul. Uh, what we're doing is once we uh, balloon across the distal CTO cap, uh, we're gonna, Elliot's going to take the retrograde equipment out, and then we're basically just back to careful angioplasty. Uh, I, I don't make, want to make that sound kind of trite, but at this stage, uh, we want to be absolutely meticulous that we get a good long-term result for this patient. That's going to involve intravascular ultrasound assessment. It's going to involve careful assessment of the proximal LED, etc. So. I think we're, we're at the stage of the procedure where we think we've troubleshooted most of the problems that we anticipated yeah. beforehand, but we're not going to let our guard drop till we've, we've got a great result for this gentleman. Yeah, what I'm going to do here. Elliot, let's see your hands. All, all I'm doing here is we're going to trap out so that we can use the anti-grade wire, but I'm going to, because we've got a guide liner down and there's interplay at the back end, I'm just going to trap using the retrograde wire because we don't need to protect that. I think we've, we've got sure. five minutes of transmission time. I think the really important point that James question. made was that you, you keep your anti-grade and your retrograde equipment as separate as you ever possibly can, because there have been cases reported, as we know, where there's been, um, where there's been entrapment of the anti-grade and retrograde equipment. This, you can cut the tip off, Elliot. Yeah, I can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can do that. But I mean, we're, we're, we're at a point where I, I just, um, from our perspective here at Barts, I just like to summarize the case. We've got a couple of minutes left. So, post bypass case, I don't think there was a conventional solution for that distal LED. The gentleman had bypass already. There's a failed lemma already. There's not a surgical solution for that. We know from our audit data that about 60% of these patients just get tablets. I think I, uh, this gentleman's very lucky that he's got access to uh, a skilled operator like Elliot uh, and a flexible mindset to show that the solution to these percutaneous problems sometimes just requires a bit of innovative thinking. So the, we had a vein graft onto a diagonal. We had uh, disease at the ostium of the LED. We, we required to reopen the, the LED. We went, came down with a dual lumen catheter and we wired the distal LED. And now we've converted it basically to uh, LED angioplasty. And we'll be able to show you the result uh, when you come back to Bart's later. But uh, I would like to give my congratulations to Elliot and the team. I know how much work has gone into making this case a success. And I think it's, it's a very uh, good lesson for us all that planning usually translates to success. So congratulations to Elliot and the team. Thanks, guys, for coming team. along. And well thanks done. for uh, allowing us to uh, show you this case. Hi guys, welcome back. Can you hear us? Yeah, we hear the last case was really well received. Lots of great comments over coffee. 
Uh, so, well done. Fantastic. <laughs> well, we've just got... Uh, We've just got one minute or so just to update you on this case before we go over to the second case in Lab 2 where they're progressing. Uh, so you joined us with a wire down the LAD. We've done most of the hard work and done reverse cart. If you just show us the... Uh, can you see the current image that's yeah, running? Yeah. So yeah, we've uh, well. ballooned and stented, and you can see that actually we managed to dilate the very distal lesion. It looked quite small, but in fact it took a 2.5 stent. So we've got a 2.5 by 38 distally, and approximately we have a... Uh, 2.5 by 32 overlap approximately by a 3.5 stent. We've taken that up to 4.0. Next shot, what you can see on that shot is that the diagonal looks like the slow flow, but of course the diagonal is filled by the vein graft. So here you can see the full extent of complete revascularization of the LAD and the diagonal, just and it really looks very good indeed. We also have an IVUS run as well. Just hold that shot because you can see really quite clearly what, what you've done is you've just you had enough room at the ostium of the LAD to drop us drop the stent there. You didn't have to do anything in relationship to the LAD diagonal bifurcation. You just dropped a stent at the ostium of the LAD. Yeah, yeah? that's what it looks yeah, like. No, the, the, the stent is actually slightly proximal to, to the uh, Remus stroke diagonal, Tony. Um, uh, I think that the, the, probably the two considerations, I'll show the IVUS in, in two seconds, but number one... The, the, James, you're a bit difficult to hear. Can someone turn the... up James's microphone slightly? Can you hear me? Yeah, no, is better. that better? better? Okay, I was just saying one of the issues is what you do with patent vein grafts in this scenario, and that's why, if you go back a view, Carmel, that's why this view is especially... Go back a view, please, Andrew Graham. This view is especially reassuring for us because you see there's hardly any flow into the diagonal there. That would, we would hope that the diagonal would be essentially walled off and, and stop reperfusing the LED retrogradely. If it doesn't, sometimes these graphs need to be closed because you create an area of low shear stress at that point and that can uh, promote restenosis, etc. We, we can show you the IVUS very quickly, the We've proximal vessel. The IVUS. Very quickly, yeah, and then we'll, we'll go to the other lab. The IVUS, but just while you're looking at the IVUS running, just, you can just see interesting this is the proximal you took a 2.5 millimeter vessel. stent up to four rather than take a bigger stent to start with. What was that about? No, 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 we, did, no, no, no. no we didn't, Tony. We, <laughs> we took a 2.5 distal to the diagonal, and then we took a short 3.5, and then took the okay. 3.5 up to okay. four. Yeah, and as you, at the point you made is well made that the overexpansion limits of stents are critical to get a good durable result. And you can see that the stent on that IVUS is very well opposed. It's distal to the left main stem. Uh, the apposition is, is uh, absolutely fine. There's a, there's a plaque burden there, but non-occlusive into the left main. So we're very happy with our intravascular imaging. We're very happy with her angiography. Our patient has tolerated it extremely well. 150 mils of contrast in a complex case like this in a renal transplant. So uh, I'm very pleased with the outcome. Yeah, I think the patient will be result. as well. So, so uh, guys, if we can take you straight over, because we don't want to see us talking, you want to see the next case. Yeah. So we'd like to go over to Lab 2, uh, where the guys will introduce themselves. Yeah. So, great. Thank you very much.